Well, good morning again. So glad that you guys are here. As I said, I'm Brent. I'm the lead pastor here. And I have a question to start with this morning. Have you ever known somebody who did something that you would classify just crazy? Maybe uh, they gave a large sum of money to a ministry. Maybe they quit their very high-paying job or lucrative job to do something that seemed just out of the ordinary and to give of themselves in a way that just didn't seem to make any sense. Have you ever experienced that? Have you seen that? Have you seen people maybe that have sold all their stuff, downsized their life a little bit so they could live simpler and give more of themselves away? Recently, I was talking with a pastor here in Des Moines, and he was telling me about his new church plant. It's been going for just a couple of years. And he was talking to me about the people that were on staff at his church. And it was it's kind of interesting. Planting a church is not an easy thing. And when you start as a church, it's not like you have tons of money. So you can't typically go in and have like five staff people paid to do everything. You have to work into that. But he had like four or five people on staff already. And as we're talking, it's like, where did these people come from? How did you get these people? And what he told me was that at some of the people that had joined his church plant, they're not from here. They're from the Twin Cities. And the reason they're here is because they heard him speak, and they were so motivated and so compelled by what he was saying, and the motivated and compelled by the opportunity to take Jesus, to share Jesus in the Des Moines area. Not that it's not being shared, but it never hurts to have other churches and other people out there doing it. But they were so compelled by the opportunity to share Jesus Christ and bring the kingdom of God to Des Moines to help, help the other churches that are here do that, that they were willing to do some pretty crazy things. They quit their jobs. They sold their houses. They moved their kids. They raised support from family and friends. And what's so amazing is I had the opportunity to meet a few of these people and do you know when I talked to them, they didn't look at this and go, well, yeah, here we are. We gave up a lot to be here. That never crossed their lips. What I heard from them was genuine excitement, genuine just thrilledness to be here. Just like we're so, man, people are coming to this church that were unchurched and their people are finding Jesus that didn't know Jesus. And you know what? We get to be a part of that. We get to be a part of what God is doing here through this church. And I thought, that's amazing. That's a little bit crazy because they saw what they were doing not as a sacrifice, not as a trial, not as a difficulty, but as something they were able to do, that they were given the opportunity to be a part of the movement of God. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I hear people do things like this, where they sell out and move or, you know, crazy people that decide to become missionaries, you know, there's, there's thoughts that go through my head. And if in my most honest moments, there's typically a couple of things that go through my head. The first one is this, you weirdos, what is wrong with you? See, you're laughing because some of you are with me because you've heard these stories and you immediately think that too. Like, it's like, wow, that's weird. And then the second thing that I have a tendency to think about is, well, you must not have that much to give up because it's really not that big a deal for you to sell your house. Your kids aren't old enough to be forced to move and take them out of a high school and all this kind of stuff. So, so you, don't, you don't have a good job. You don't like your job. You don't make that much money. So it's really easy for you. And so we try to kind of minimize the sacrifice. But if you're like me, when I hear somebody that's willing to do that, there's something deep down within me, a nagging voice even, that just kind of wonders, what do they know that I don't? What do they see that I don't see? And it leads me to a question of, am I missing something? Because what motivates somebody to be willing to completely sell out, to completely reorient their lives, to live a completely different countercultural existence, all for the kingdom of God. What is it that causes someone to do that? I think that's an important question we have to ask. What motivates some people to live this way, give up the normal comforts of life? Is there something that they see that's worth making this level of sacrifice? Is there something worth giving everything for? Now, I realize that's improper English, but I just like the way it sounds. Is there something worth giving everything for? 
That's what I want us to look at today. Last week, we kicked off our summer series, as I said earlier. We're going to be going through the book of Matthew in various places, and we're looking at teachings and parables of Jesus, as we're calling it the red letters. These are the things that Jesus actually said. And the problem with what Jesus actually says is sometimes we get lost in the fun stuff, the good stuff, the easy stuff. God loved the world, and we think, that's great, that's awesome. But if we're not careful, we'll hyper-focus on those things that are easy to understand and make us feel good to the exclusion of the things that Jesus said that are really hard and difficult and challenging and really call us out from where we live into this counter-cultural existence that says you can't just stay here if you're going to follow me. If you're really going to follow me, it's going to require something different. And these are more the difficult teachings of Jesus, the difficult parables that we see. And we started off last week, and Ryan did a great job as he talked to us about what it meant to be great. And in our own culture, we know that everybody says, you look out for number one, make your own way. Nobody's going to sell you but you. And Jesus comes along and says, stop fighting over who's the greatest. If you really want to be great, you know what you have to do? You've got to be a servant to all. And that makes no sense to us at all. That makes no sense to any of us because we are living in a culture that says we need to step on people to get what we want. And Jesus says, oh no, be stepped on to find true greatness in this life. I don't know about you, but I left a little convicted. I know that teaching. I don't like to hear that teaching. I want to do it the other way. I want to be elevating Brent. And Jesus says, no, go outside and pick up trash, Brent. That's how you get elevated. So I thought that was a challenging message, but it's still the message that Jesus spoke. And today we're going to look at two very short parables that Jesus told his disciples. And to answer that question, is there something worth giving everything for? And if you have your Bible or your phone, it'll be on the screen. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 13. Three short verses that we're going to read that Jesus talks to his disciples and teaches his disciples. And as you think about this, what I want to remind you is today we're looking at a parable. What is a parable? A parable is just a story, an extended metaphor that Jesus often used to make a point. It's not a literal description of anything, and it typically only teaches one or two points. It doesn't teach a million different things. And really, for us to understand the parables, we have to think about what it meant to the original audience, understand the meaning then so that we can bring the application forward. And so in Matthew's gospel, what's interesting is often he wrote parables in pairs. He would say two things about the same idea to bring them together to add a little more depth to what Jesus was trying to teach and to reach people at different levels with different different ideas. So at this point in his ministry, just so you know, Matthew chapter 13, Jesus had experienced great popularity. People were clamoring to get around him. They were bringing the sick people to him, and he's healing people, and things are going great, and he's got the Sermon on the Mount, and he's feeding thousands and thousands of people at various times. And then as the ministry goes on, the crowds begin to leave. He doesn't maintain that same level of popularity the whole time. And what we find in Matthew 13 is the crowds had started to fall off a little bit. And you see why this is important, because Jesus is going to point out to the disciples That there is not a small difference, but there is a big difference between those who are around Jesus just for the show, those who are around Jesus just for the handout, those who are around Jesus because it makes them look good. There's a difference between those people and his true disciples, those who really see and know and understand the value of following Jesus, those who know and understand the value of the kingdom of God and those who are willing to sacrifice anything to be a part of it. So look at Matthew 13. We're going to read verses 44 through 46. Here's what Jesus says. These are all red letters today. So, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls, When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. 
Now, as we read these two short parables, I think it's important for us to highlight a few things that this par- these parables are not saying, okay? So as you read that first parable, we read about this guy. He stumbles upon a field. He finds a treasure. He looks at the treasure, and he's like, I'm going to go buy this field from this guy. And we think, hmm, is there an ethical question in play here? Is this a legal issue? Jesus is not addressing that. That's not at all in play here. That doesn't matter. We're not addressing whether the the ethicalness, should the guy have told the landowner what was there? I mean, you find commentators that want to talk about this, how Jewish law was 10, 10, um, what do we say, nine-tenths of the law. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. There it was ten-tenths, and so it was perfectly within his right. But Jesus doesn't want us to focus on that. There's something else there. The second thing that we don't want to look at is this. Jesus is not saying that you can purchase salvation. He's not saying, sell, give enough money, do enough good deeds, do this, and you can earn it. Because that goes against everything else we see in the New Testament where Jesus and the apostles teach and say, no, salvation can never be purchased. It is always a free gift of God. It is freely given to us because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And then thirdly, I think this is as as equally as important. Is, is Jesus is not saying that all people everywhere, anyone who follows him, will be required to give up everything they have, to sell everything they own, to take a vow of poverty in order to truly be his disciple. That's not being said either. Again, looking at the Bible, we don't see Jesus or any of the New Testament writers saying that that is what it means to follow Jesus, that we give a certain amount of money away. Now, there is a theme here that I think we have to address, and it's important because it says that we should be willing to give everything up, even though Jesus may not call us to. It's not a universal call for all people to give up everything they have. So that's important. So Jesus is not saying these three things. So what I want to do is let's dig into this parable a little bit and figure out what is he saying. Because I think what you'll find is this message Most of the teachings of Jesus, they fall into this category. They're very simple to say. They're very simple to comprehend and understand. They're very difficult to live out. I mean, last week's teaching is exactly in that category. It's very easy to say, to be great, you submit and serve. It's very easy to understand. I can get that. I understand it. But when it comes to actually living that out each and every day, that's a challenge. And today is going to be equally challenging. So let's dig in a little bit here. What do these teach? What do these parables teach us? I love these parables because it begins with this man. The first one begins with a man. And because he's working in a field, it tells us a little bit about him. He's probably a poor guy. He doesn't have a lot of means. He doesn't have a lot to to himself. But he's out there working hard. And what he's doing is as he's working the field, he uncovers this treasure. What kind of treasure? Most likely it was a jar filled with somebody's valuables. Now, we think that's a little strange, but remember, back in the first century, they didn't have safe deposit boxes at the bank that they could hide their stuff. There was a lot of political unrest, and it wasn't uncommon for an army from a neighboring city or town to just come over and try to, you know, beat you down and wipe you out and take all your stuff. So if you knew an army was coming, it was very common for you to take your possessions and go into your field and bury it under the ground. That way, if the army came into your house and tried to find your stuff, you could be like, ha ha, it's not here. You can't get my stuff. But the problem was, is if they killed you, then nobody knew where your stuff was. And so somebody would just have to uncover it in order to find it. And that's exactly what happened, is this guy is out there working. He's not looking for it. He's not thinking, let me dig in this field and see if there's treasure here. No, he's just working a normal job. And as he's working, he just stumbles across it. As I thought about this, I thought, you know, he's not one of these guys out there on the beach with his metal detector trying to find stuff. No, he's just just working the land just like he normally would. And as he's doing what he normally does each and every day, he stumbles across this incredible find, this incredible treasure. And as he looks at it and as he sees it, immediately he recognizes what he's got. He sees incredible value to what is before him. So much so that he says, I'm going to cover this back up. I don't want to just leave valuable treasure laying around. So I'm going to cover it up, and then I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go, and I'm going to sell everything I've got. I'm going to do, I'm liquidating it all. Everything must go. It's out of here. 
because I need to buy that field. Now, legally, I think that's exactly how the system worked. If you bought the field, you bought everything that was in the field, and it became his. He didn't want a question of whether or not he owned it, so he sold out, did everything, gave everything he had to get that treasure, which is amazing to me because I, it makes me wonder, first, what is that treasure? What is in that box? What is in that jar that he uncovers that he says, no amount of money that I have, no amount of anything that I own compares to that? That's got to be amazing, right? That has to be something so beyond what even I can comprehend that he says, everything else I have is garbage compared to getting that treasure. So he does. He sells it all. He buys the land and he gets it. And then that's it. That's the end of the first parable. And then Jesus comes in with this second parable. And we have something that's kind of similar, but a little bit different because we're told about a merchant. Now, a merchant would not have been a guy without money. In fact, he was probably a guy with money. So he's a little different than the first guy. And this guy doesn't stumble upon something. In fact, he's actually searching for something. He's looking. He's, make, he's actually out there in the world saying, I know what I'm after. I'm looking for it. I want to find it. And then we're told that one day he does. He finds it. He sees it. He finds this pearl of incredible value. The Beckers have a pearl of incredible value, right? Now, for me, I know nothing about jewelry. I know nothing about pearls. And so I had to do a little bit of research on this. And I thought, how valuable could a pearl be, right? I mean, I mean I've just seen them on necklaces. And most of them were fake. So basically... There were two stories that I read that were phenomenal to help me understand this because one of them said that Caesar gave Brutus's mother, if you remember your history, a pearl worth more than $400,000 then. $400,000 then. And then the other story was that Cleopatra had a pearl worth $4 million or $4 billion. I heard two different stories this week, and so it was hard to track down. But somewhere in that, that's a pretty fancy pearl. And so what happens is you have this guy, and he's not just looking for anything. He's not looking for fake substitutes. He's not looking for anything that'll just pacify. He's looking for the thing. The one thing that he knows supersedes and is greater than any other thing. And he finds it. And when he finds it, he does exactly what the first guy does. He sells out. He does anything and everything he can to get his hands on that treasure and own that treasure. And even though they come from different backgrounds, and even their motivation is different, one stumbling upon it and one seeking for it, their reaction to, to, for both of them is the same. And both of them show us that the, the, the message of the parable is just simply this, that the kingdom of God is so valuable that it is worth sacrificing any and everything to get it. The kingdom of God is so valuable, so important, so that we should be willing to sacrifice anything and everything to get it. Now, as I said, this is easy to say, and it makes sense maybe to us in our minds, but actually living that out is a whole different story. What makes it so difficult? Well, I know for me, just the fact that it uses the expression kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven in some places or kingdom at all, I don't understand kingdoms. I'm American. A couple weeks ago, they had the big royal wedding over in uh, the UK. I don't get it. Now, I would love to be a royal. I'd love to have no job, no responsibilities, and for people to pay for everything that I do, and I could live in palaces and, you know, private boats and private planes and all this. I think that'd be awesome. Anybody with me? Anybody want to sign up for that lifestyle? Let's do it. I don't get it. I don't understand it. And even in the UK, it's not their traditional monarchy anymore because they're more figureheads. But when we talk about kingdom, what are we talking about here? I'm, I had five things, and we're not going to go through these five things. I'll put them out on a blog post this week for you. Let me tell you what the kingdom of God is. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Pure and simple, the kingdom of God is Jesus. When Jesus took on human flesh, when he came into this world, God in human form, he began bringing about a change to what existed. The messed up, broken system that was out here, 
that we live in every day. Jesus came and said, there's a new way. There's a new system. There's a new thing. But there is a difference between the kingdom you're used to and the kingdom that Jesus came to bring because in our kingdom, we basically get to do whatever we want to do. We sit on the throne. We are the kings and the queens in our kingdom. And we just dictate and we do whatever we want. And Jesus says, well, let me tell you what. I'm coming and I'm doing something new. This is a new kingdom. And guess who the king is? Not you. Jesus says, I'm the king of this kingdom. And it's so amazing and it's so awesome and it's so wonderful. But in order to be in this kingdom, it requires us to submit and to be under him, King Jesus. And that's where the rub is. That's where the difficulty is. Because we look at these two kingdoms and we think, I don't like this trade. I don't like this trade. I like me in my comfortable life, doing what I want to do, living the way I want to live, with really little to no accountability except my wife. That's for the husbands. Yeah, wives get to do whatever, right? Maybe. But we live with no accountability. We can do whatever we want. Say whatever we want. We live. I'll do it. It's my life. So what is it about the kingdom of God? What is it about Jesus that is worth giving up? And as I read this parable, this is where the challenge is for me, is because I wonder, what do I not see? What am I missing that the two men in this parable see? Because I want to look at it and I would say, God, I really like my job. God, I really like my house. God, I really like my lifestyle. God, I really like fill in the blank. And yet when I look at what Jesus is saying, he's drawing a line in the sand and he's saying, look, there are a lot of people in this world who are wannabes. They come for the show and they want just a taste of Jesus. And Jesus says, that's not how it works. Because to be a part of his kingdom, to be a part of what he's doing in the world means that we not necessarily have to sell out and give up everything, but we have to be willing to give up and sell out everything. How do I know this? Because there are two different examples I find in Scripture where, that I think are just amazing of either side of this. Because one of them was the rich man who came to see Jesus in Mark 10. And he comes and he says, Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? And you know what Jesus says? He says to him, you know what you got to do? Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And the rich guy's feeling really good. And he says, whew, I got that under control. And Jesus says, oh, yeah, by the way, sell everything you've got. And this, one of the saddest script verses in the Bible, it says this guy went away sad because he was very wealthy. And you know what Jesus always does to us is he knows exactly where to put the finger on the thing that might be standing between us and being completely sold out to him. And for the rich guy, it was that. It was his wealth. For you, it may be something else. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your stuff. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your attitude. Maybe it's your emotional baggage. Maybe it's whatever. But Jesus knows how to say, look, we need to be willing even to lay this down for the kingdom. The other example we see in scripture is the apostle Paul. One of the best passages where he talks about all that he was and all that he is in life. And he's like, I'm well educated. And I was a Pharisee among Pharisees. I was this great guy in the community. Everybody loved and respected me. And he says, and you know what I think about all that now? It's garbage. He says, I, will, I sold it out. I got rid of everything. You know why? For the p- p- possibility, for the potential of knowing Jesus Christ. I was willing to lay it down. And so this morning, I just kind of, I, I wrapped this up. And this has been short, which is great. But I think that's the message. It's just this simple. What are we holding on to so tightly 
that is keeping us from the kingdom. Do you see what the man and the merchant saw? When you see the kingdom of God, when you see Jesus Christ, do you see it as a nice add-on to your life, something else to be brought in, as something just a part of what, yeah, what's going on? Or do you see it the way these guys saw it? And you go, it's so valuable. It's so worth it. I'm willing to give up everything. I'm willing to lay down everything in order to get it. See, I think that's the message. You can see, when you see what these guys did when they saw the treasure, their lives radically changed. And I think that's a challenge for us is because we have to ask ourselves, when we think about our lives in response to God and to Jesus and what he's done for us, do we see that radical transformation? Do we see the life change? And if we don't, I wonder, can we say we've really seen the treasure if we haven't reoriented our lives to it? And that's a challenging teaching, even for me. And you know, I would love to come up here and say, look at me, you're a great pastor. You know what I did? I had a great banking career 10, 11 years ago. I had a great job. I made great money. I had a house with a pool in the backyard. Life was good. I didn't have any worries. And I'm so godly and so spiritual that I sold out and moved to Iowa. And here I am because I'm so spiritual. And as I was thinking this, not, technic, not really about myself, but I was thinking about my own story, I thought to myself, but what is now in my life that is keeping me from selling out to Jesus? What is it now that's keeping me from fully embracing the treasure? And that's a tough question. It's tough for us because we don't want to do that. This past week, Ryan sent me an email. He's got a friend who's a missionary in the Middle East. And in this missionary's email, he shared the story of a Middle Eastern man. And the Middle Eastern man made this statement. He said, you cannot be afraid. And the missionary went on to share the story of this guy, and this Middle Eastern guy, who had to flee for his life, from his family because he surrendered his life to Jesus. And every week he travels 12 hours, over 12 hours by bus, just so he can go do Bible lessons and worship services with others. And despite being beaten with clubs and having his head split open for the sake of the gospel, he continues to share the word of life. And I read this and I thought, this man has found the treasure. This man has found something worth giving everything for. He even discounts his own life for the opportunity to be a part of the kingdom of God. Do you live as if the kingdom of God is the most important thing in your life? Do you see the evidence of that in your life? When you make sacrifices, do you talk about them as, oh, look at me, my life, all I've had to give up? Or does it even matter because you're thinking, I know I'm getting the kingdom, I'm getting Jesus, and that's all that matters? These are tough questions. But I think it's what Jesus is calling us to. To say, as long as we are in these fleshly bodies, there's always going to be something competing. Always something that wants to be above that. But I think it's a good look to say, Let's sell. Sell it all just for the opportunity to be a part of what Jesus is doing in this world, this new kingdom, and go out and live our lives with joy transformed because we have found the treasure.